Um, for those of you who are not aware of the Teaching American History program here at BCC, um, it was inaugurated in April of 2003, and in fact, it was Professor Lowen who was the keynote speaker at that particular occasion. And um, just a little bit of background, we have, over the past years, been involved with 23 of the regional um, school districts, and we have um, had go through our program um, in the range of about 500 teachers. And as a federally funded program, uh, what we have provided for teachers in the area is uh, a series of workshops, uh, seminars, colloquia, um, summer institutes, as well as public lectures such as this. There are um, a number of people I, who are in the audience that I'd really like to thank. Um, one of the, who, who is still involved in the uh, in the program. First is uh, Professor Maureen Sawa, who um, had a profound influence on my involvement in the um, in the program. And the second individual who I know is here, um, who was part of the staff, is Eric Bauman, who was the former director of the um, of the program. And last but not least, and I hope she hasn't left yet, is the is the grant secretary, uh, that being Katie, Katie Mello. She's been involved um, continuously um, in the program since, um, I believe it's 2004, and has been the longest uh, member of the team. So I'd like to thank Katie specifically. <laughs> this afternoon, um, I'm introducing, and I'm very, very honored to, uh, to introduce the next speaker. Um, July 2000, um, President Jack Spraga started here at the college. And as president, um, one of his more, um, one of the things that he emphasizes more than anything else is um, student success. If you look at, at any of the web pages or anything else that is involved with the college, student success is number one on his list, and um, I've always been, uh, I've been thrilled with the way he has always expressed express the fact that um, the middle name of this institution is Bristol Community College, expressing its roots in the community itself. President Spraga um, holds an, an AB from Union College in Schenectady, New York, and in addition to that, he has his, he has his PhD and MA from Georgetown University. And um, as I was looking through his bio today, I wasn't aware of the fact that he has also been a Fulbright scholar um, in London in um, both economics and political science. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you President Jack Springer. Thank you, Herb, for that great, uh, gracious introduction. Um, it, is, uh, it is with mixed emotions that we meet today. Uh, uh, I remember back when uh, Professor Lowen started our program and inaugurated our program. Uh, but grants come and go, I guess, is the life, uh, is the way it is in this world. And uh, so I told him there was no reflection on him, but he's closing the program down uh, tonight. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have him, really. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, he is. Uh, uh, well known in the uh, history field and, uh, and in the popular uh, field and culture as well. Um, and uh, it's a delight to have him with us. He has uh, talked about um, uh, lies that are wrote, written about, lies that our uh, teachers told us, or what we were never told by our teachers. Uh, 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 he, uh, he is a, a very popular uh, lecturer as he goes around the country, residing in uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him with us. Uh, I, I recall, if I could uh, mention this program, uh, what a great boost it is in history. I don't know if you know what my, my degree is in history from Georgetown, and uh, uh, I spent a lot of time teaching history before I uh, became an administrator. And I just noticed today in the, uh, 
in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there's a prominent article that uh, history, history professors' salaries have uh, not kept pace with the other professors. So I thought that uh, I'll leave this here for Professor Lowe. He's better off on the, on the lecture circuit than, he, <laughs> than we have been in the history classroom. But uh, uh, again, it's, it's wonderful. I participated in this program uh, uh, teaching with uh, uh, Professor David Williams a, a, a few times in the World War II course. And I've tried to attend uh, all, uh, all of the sessions. I couldn't, uh, my schedule wouldn't let me uh, uh, complete uh, most of them, unfortunately. And, uh, and in fact, I have to apologize tonight that I might have to leave early to get to Bridgewater, uh, uh, Bridgewater State University. But uh, it's been a wonderful program. The, uh, the, uh, the teachers have been uh, uh, very effusive in their praise of the program, uh, not only for their own professional development, but also uh, uh, for that of their students, that the students uh, uh, who are many are here tonight as well uh, uh, benefit from these interchanges uh, among the faculty and uh, everyone teaching history. Years and years ago, I uh, I was involved in something. I didn't realize how avant-garde it is today, uh, but I'd like to do it. I think we're working on it today in math and English. But all, and we used to have a history uh, society in uh, Virginia. And it would involve historians from uh, uh, baccalaureate granting institutions, University of Virginia, William and Mary, uh, and uh, the community colleges, uh, as well as all of the high schools and uh, private schools in Virginia. All the history professors, and we meet, and Virginia is a big state, and we would meet uh, for annual conferences as well as regional uh, conferences. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful discussion. I, I've never forgotten that. And it reminded me of it when uh, we began the Teaching American History, uh, because that too uh, has this rich discussion. Uh, uh, there's no way, you know, kind of check titles at the door and uh, just talk about the ideas of history and the wonderful uh, exchange of ideas, which we're all about at Bristol Community College and any institution of higher learning or any institution of learning. So uh, I'm going on and on here, but it is a, kind of a bittersweet uh, occasion uh, to see the uh, program come to a close. I too want to uh, uh, extend my uh, congratulations and thanks to Eric Bauman, as well as to Herb Tracy for uh, continuing this program. I wish we had money to continue it and maybe we can do it on a voluntary basis from time to time uh, as well. Okay, so uh, enough reminiscing. I, I want to introduce to you, uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, uh, James Lowen, the uh, author, I think he's going to talk uh, today about the teaching, uh, teaching history and what really happened. Uh, and uh, he's always informative, always uh, interesting, uh, not entertaining so much, as although that happens too, but his purpose is to bring the truth to you, which uh, truth with a capital T, and the eternal verities, uh, which is what we're all about. Okay, so it's my, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, James Lowen. Thank you. So, let me uh, make two announcements <clears throat> in order to have a successful evening, Ellen. Turn off your cell phones. Thank you. Well, you already have them on. Okay, and I recommend that those of you over there especially, and maybe those of you over here too, to some degree, move this way because I'm going to be showing a bunch of photos. And I already sat over there, and so I know you can't see worth, I mean, you can't see very well. So I'll give you a minute to do that. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to say is uh, thanks for having me at the beginning and the end. Uh, it's a real honor. I mean, I must have done okay the first time, or you wouldn't have had me back. You didn't have anybody else back. And so I really appreciate that. Plus, I remember having a good time here talking with some very interesting uh, K-12 teachers, as well as folks here at ECC. Uh, when I was here low those many years ago, um, I think I've outlined, outlived the entire staff, not one person that's still working on this program, who was working on it when I was here last time. Is that true? I think so. Uh, so, so that's kind of cool. Um, I do this all over the country. Uh, the Teaching American History program is, is a good program. Uh, Partly because, uh, let me start by saying, when I went to high school, most of you have been to high school, I suspect, 
When I went, can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. When I went, no? I'm trying to use it. Oh, put it right up here. They were supposed to give me a, what's his name, Mike, that I don't have to hold, but they can't find it. Okay. Uh, when I went to high school um, in the Midwest, history slash social studies was the worst taught uh, subject in school. And some of you are nodding, so it's clear that you don't have to go to high school in the Midwest for this to happen. Uh, in fact, um, I don't think this will work here. I'm sure it won't, but now that I've got you thinking about what will work, I'm going to ask the question anyway. Uh, how many of you, when you went to high school, had a high school history teacher whose first name was Coach? Can I see hands? <laughs> well, a fair number. Now, I asked that question one time at Texas A&M to a big audience, and I got applause just for asking the question, and 60% of the audience raised their hand. Well, this is my best self advice my teacher told me. I sometimes say I could have subtitled it, Revenge Against Coach DeMolin, because he was my history teacher, and he was also the basketball coach. Now, incidentally, I'm not talking about a guy whose passion is history and who is the history teacher and who also coaches basketball. You understand I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the basketball coach who has to teach something, right? And there aren't enough PE classes, or phys ed classes, whatever you call them here in Massachusetts, to go around. So he's got to teach something else. What's he going to teach? Well, he can't teach English, or the students will wind up illiterate. Um, even Coach Dolan doesn't think he can teach math. So let's have him teach something that doesn't matter. That's the thinking, right? That's the mindset in the central office when they assign coaches across the South also uh, to teach history. Okay? How hard can it be? So all he did was go by what's in the book and, and ask us the endless questions at the end of each chapter, and we wrote them all down. It was very sad. My, my favorite question is, when did the War of 1812 start? <laughs> you can have yours, maybe. Okay. The pitiful thing was he was, I mean, everybody knew that he was not hired or fired on the basis of how he taught history. He was hired or fired on the basis of the one loss record of the basketball team, right? And I come from Larry Bird territory, one state over, but still basketball is the sport in central Illinois. What was really pitiful, and this is enough, I, I won't rant about this beyond this sentence, but he was a bad basketball coach too. All right. Well, how then did I get so interested in history? Well, it wasn't because of high school. Um, now, of course, I have to say, uh, I want to point out, first of all, that I'm not a history professor. I'm actually a professor of sociology. I have a MA, a BA, an MA, and a PhD in sociology. Okay? The MA and PhD came from down the road at, at HU in uh, Cambridge. Um, my BA was from, from a, a, a college in Minnesota. But that's in sociology. What got me so interested in history? Well, that was an experience I had in my first full-time teaching job, which was at Tougaloo College. That is T-O-U-G-A-L-O-O. -O -O. There's going to be a quiz at the end. Um, it's a small college. It's a black college, and it's in Mississippi, and so not too many folks up here in Yankee land have heard of it. Um, but it's where I went directly out of Harvard, uh, and I taught there for eight years. Now, my first year there, uh, I was teaching the courses I expected to be teaching in sociology, but I also taught one section of a course called the Freshman Social Science Seminar. Uh, this was a course that, you know the drill, it introduced students to poli-sci, social econ, psych, anthro. And it did this in the context of African-American history. Made sense, 99% of our students being African-American. And furthermore, it had been set up by the history department. Okay, so I was teaching one section of that. Second semester started. Second semester starts of course, not only right after Christmas, but also right after the Civil War, whether you're in American history or African American history, it's the same chronology. So I didn't want to do all the talking that first day of class. So I asked my students, what happened right after the Civil War? What happened during Reconstruction? And what happened to me was, we might call it an aha reaction, although a better term might be an oh no reaction. 16 out of 17 of my students said, well, that was the period right after the Civil War when blacks took over the government of the southern states, but they were too soon out of slavery, and so they screwed up, and white folks had to take control again. 
Good. I, I heard a little whistle here. I saw a head shake there. There's something wrong there, isn't there? As a matter of fact, there's three direct lies in that sentence. Okay? Can I see a hand for, or a shout out for the first one? Blacks took over. Thank you. You're, you're nameless people up there. Um, exactly. All of the southern states had white governors throughout Reconstruction. All but one had a white legislative majority. Let's try that we can do the second one by shout out. Line number two. Okay, let's see a hand. I heard that in Wittawa. Where, where, where? Not him. He, he heard hosting me already. I'm not going to call him. Yes, sir. They screwed up. Thank you. Um, the, the Reconstruction governments across the South, without exception, passed the best state constitutions that the southern states have ever had, including better than the ones that they labor under today. They started the public school system for both races. Mississippi, where I was, had had scattered public schools in the larger towns for white folks, but no system that included the whole state. And of course, they had no public schools whatsoever for black folks, and indeed it was a felony to teach blacks, even free blacks, to read and write during slavery time. So they started the public school system for both races. They did various other interesting and important things. Uh, again, in particular, Mississippi had better government during Reconstruction than at any later point in the 19th century. And so then line number three would be that white folks didn't take control at the end of Reconstruction. Instead, a certain group, white racist Democrats, and it's hard to remember this, especially those of you who are younger, because in 1964, the two parties completed a flip-flop on this matter. But in the 19th century, the Democrats were the party of white supremacy, called themselves the White Man's Party, into the 1920s. And they took over using KKK tactics, and indeed it was, of course, the original Ku Klux Klan. So I thought to myself, my gosh, what could it, must it do to you to believe that the one time your group was center stage in American history, they screwed up? Can't be good for you. Uh, now, if it's happened, that's another matter. Then you have to think about it. Why did this happen? What's going on here? Figure it out. But it did not happen. Indeed, this is what we in sociology call an example of BS history. Right? <laughs> that is, of course, bad sociology. <laughs> I like this group. See, I used that joke nine years ago when I was here. Oh, wait, do we have earthquakes in Actually, we do. Okay. Um, so that experience actually caused me to realize that history can be a weapon and that it can be used against you. And in fact, it had been used against my students. Uh, I have a whole story that, that goes on from there. Uh, I think it's mentioned maybe on the poster. So you can all gather around the poster on your way out. It's on the glass doors and, and read it. Uh, or you can ask me about it in the question period. But I want to do something else with you uh, right now. In fact, what I actually want to do with you, or maybe I should say to you, uh, I want to hold a referendum in this room. I don't think I've done this in the state of Massachusetts, although I've done it all over the country, so I may have done it here. Uh, I want to ask you, this is the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, right? Uh, just about exactly, and in fact, since December 20th, we've been going through the 150th anniversary of secession. Uh, first with South Carolina on December 20th of last year, 150 years before. And, and now we're moving up towards when Virginia and uh, North Carolina and the last states, uh, North Carolina and Texas, uh, Tennessee, seceded. So the question I want to ask you is, why did South Carolina, followed by 10 other states, secede? Why did they leave the Union? Now, I'm going to, thanks for shouting out an, an idea. I didn't hear what the idea was, but that's good. Uh, if I took more time, and I know because I've done this several times across the country, um, I could generate four answers to me. And I know because I've generated them all over the country. These are the only four answers you ever get, and they're all, the only four answers anybody ever gives, and they are sensible. Well, they're not exactly at all sensible, but they are the four answers. And here's what, here they are, all right? Now, I want to pause for just a moment and discuss this technology. This is called an overhead. Um, some of you have heard of it, and they are good. Okay? Um, this could be, this scene could be better done using a PowerPoint, but everything else I'm going to show you just about uh, will look better here than in any other way. That's why I use this. Um, 
because I can show you photographs and pixelating them and showing them on a computer uh, messes them up. I mean, they're, they're not as crisp. So that's why I'm using this. So don't go out your overheads. They will rise again. Okay. <laughs> These are the four answers you get. You get the answer that the southern states seceded over slavery, maintenance and preservation and expansion of slavery. They seceded over states' rights. They seceded because of the election of Lincoln. They seceded about tariffs and taxes, or issues about tariffs and taxes. Okay? Now, I want you all to vote. I want you to choose one. This is not your problem. You can only vote once. Okay? And second of all, I don't want you, can I get your agreement not to abstain? You might say, oh, geez, Lohan, I think it's number two and number four. I can't choose. Choose one. Is that OK? Did I get amen on that? Okay. So I'm going to write on this front page of the Chronicle. I do look forward to reading the article, which starts later. How many of you are going to vote that? The South seceded over slavery. Hands up. Only one hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to, how am I going to do this? Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, I think I counted him twice, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 over there, 21, 22, 23, 24, I don't know, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Okay. Thank you. The South seceded for states' rights. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Three, one, two, three, 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 four, three, five, six, two, seven, eight, nine, three, thirty-one. The South seceded because of the election of Lincoln. One, two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> The South seceded over tariffs and taxes. One, two, is that it? Oh. One, two, thank you. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, eight, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I think I missed I think I missed one there. I'm gonna call it nineteen, because they can't tell me that. Do we have E, all and all the above? <laughs> you let him in. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, the grand total is 89. I like it when the grand total is 100, because then I can do the percentages really fast. Um, but nevertheless, we'll see what we can do. That's about 37% saying slavery, um, about 35% saying states' rights maybe 7% saying Lincoln, and maybe 22 or so percent saying tariffs and taxes. Let's see if that adds up. Oh, no, it's not too bad. 12 plus 9 is 1 plus 1. Oops. Yeah, that adds up to 101%. That's pretty quick. I'm pretty close to just doing it on the top of my head. OK, so slavery narrowly won, 37%. But state rights were 35, and TNT, tariffs and taxes were 22. That's pretty close to So we doesn't look like we can just stop now, can we? I mean, this is not how we do history anyway. Um, let me tell you how, how this election comes out usually. Um, typically, across the United States, 60 to 75% of my audiences, especially when my audiences are K-12 teachers, which they often are, 60 to 75% say states' rights. So I'm now going to put a little star and a little finger pointing in at states' rights. This is very high tech. Because <laughs> um, it usually wins an outright majority. And the other percentages come out kind of close to this. Slavery comes in a, different, a distant second, usually, and tariffs and taxes after that. And then more people said Abraham Lincoln, 7%. Usually he gets about 2%. Okay. All right. What we need is what? To determine this issue, what do we need? Not all at once now. What do we hand up if that would be better? What do we need? Majority. No. What? Majority. No, we don't need a majority. We need something else. Facts. Facts is a good answer. Evidence, right? 
Okay, so what would be, let's have a hand for this one, an actual hand. Okay. All right, everybody put their hand up. Okay, you can do it. All right, I thought you could do it. Um, so that gets you ready. Um, what would be good evidence? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. No, 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 yes, ma'am. Diary entries of whom? Diary entries of politicians, maybe. That's not bad. And you mean diary, en diary entries, let's say, from, um, oh, Governor Haley Barber of Mississippi, who just quit being a presidential candidate? No, diary entries from when? From the time. Okay, I knew you meant that, but I mean, you've got to get it out there. Okay. But not bad, but there's better. Yes, ma'am. Newspaper articles, especially editorials? Newspaper articles, editorials from, from the time. Okay. From, say, Portland, Oregon? From everywhere. From everywhere. No. From where? Yes, ma'am. People's diaries. What? The average person's diaries. Diaries? Yeah, that's what she said. Yes, sir. A man. Documents from the people who seceded. There she goes. Documents from the folks who seceded. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, well, she's, let's stick with her. Um, the votes are okay. She's done the votes of the people who seceded. How did the, the southern states secede? Well, most of them did it by convention. They, they actually had a convention. Not all of them did it this way, but most of them did, and certainly South Carolina did. And my newest book, um, not by coincidence, uh, this is the first time I ever actually wrote a book in time for something, uh, is called The Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader. Subtitle is The Great Truth About the Lost Cause. And the great truths and lost cause are both in quotes because they come from some very famous documents. And you've seen this flag, I suspect. Um, this is not your typical Confederate book, though. So uh, you want to make sure, incidentally, that your high school, even if you graduated from it long ago, has a copy. And that your high school history teachers, even if the ones you have are dead, they, they have something else to do now, uh, that they have read it, or at least read it. Uh, the introduction to it and some of it. Um, so please go, that's your homework assignment. Um, you don't have to go by it. I don't know why I say that. My publisher hates me, but uh, make sure that, that your high school has it, the high school unit closest to you. And of course, this college library. Um, when they seceded, and she's on the ball, when they seceded, they said why. The convention said why. And we could read newspaper articles uh, of, the, of the secession thing, that'd be cool. Um, we can read the diaries of what the folks said who were in the secession convention, that'd be cool. But the very best thing of all, well, I'm just going to give you this idea. How about this title? This is what South Carolina said when it seceded. Ooh, let me say no flash okay? Like that. <laughs> Thanks. Because I'm a scientist. I don't have any of this fear at this point. Um, here's what South Carolina passed as it seceded. Listen to this title. Declaration of the Immediate Causes Which Induce and Justify the Secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union. Does that sound relevant? That's, what, that's the smoking gun, right? Now, what does this document do? Well, it starts out with kind of a really bad, not kind of a, with a really bad uh, history of the United States, kind of a constitutional history. Only this constitutional history leaves out, pretty much leaves out the Constitution. Which is interesting. It emphasizes the Articles of Confederation because that was a lot looser. Right? Only thing wrong with that is we only stayed under it for about eight years. And furthermore, South Carolina was one of the leaders to have a tighter federal government, a stronger central government, and a constitution. They don't say that. And they don't say anything about this. This is the main part of the, of the state seal of South Carolina, then and now. And if you notice it, it is. What do you see? You see mainly a palmetto tree, a little palm tree in the center. That's the symbol of the state of South Carolina. And you see on either side, this is kind of a drawing, a, a schematic drawing, of what's called a fasces. Uh, you know what a fasces is? A fasces is when you take, in this case, 13 twigs, and you bind them with twine. You wind up with something you can beat somebody over the head with, right? This is a symbol of, of fascism, yes, Italian or anybody else's fascism. Uh, it means a unity of their strength, right? And here they show six pikes on either side, and they're bound together. Now, in a real fashion, they'd be lined up like this, but that doesn't 
show as well. And so they, this is, of course, the 13 original states, right? South Carolina nationally, the biggest and right in the middle. And it's tied together with a head that says, quis separavit, which means, who shall separate us? Somehow this kind of sentiment was not yet mentioned by South Carolina in 1860. Duh. All right. After this really bad history, then they get into exactly why we are seceding. And what do they say? Well, let me quote you some from this document. Oh, I've got it. Nicer printed here. I mean, it's printed well there, but I don't want to mess the book, binding of the book up. Here's what they say. We assert that 14 of the states have deliberately refused for years past to fulfill their constitutional obligations, and we refer to their own statutes for the proof. Constitutional obligations, that sounds kind of vague, doesn't it? But they go right on to say what they're talking about. Here's what they go on to say. The Constitution of the United States, in its fourth article, provides as follows, quote, no person held a service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Now that's the one. That's the fugitive slave clause in the Constitution. It's beginning to sound like maybe it has something to do with that S word, slavery. And then they go on to speak directly about states' rights. And here's what they have to say about states' rights. They are upset about states' rights. Listen carefully. They are against states' rights. And they tell you exactly which states and which rights upset them. The states of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, they name a bunch of other states all the way out to Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa have enacted laws which either nullify the acts of Congress or render useless any attempt to execute them. In many of these states, the fugitive is discharged from the service of labor claim, and in none of them has the state government complied with the stipulation made in the Constitution. So they're mad, they're mad at Massachusetts, among other states, because Massachusetts uh, helped the uh, state slave not get sent back south in, in Boston. Uh, same thing happened in Syracuse. Uh, same thing happened in some other northern states. They're upset with Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania has, and some other states have passed what's called individual liberty laws. Here's an example of what pa Pennsylvania passed. You know, under the Fugitive Slave Act, which is this draconian national act passed in 1850, um, it works like this. I'm going to pick on, okay, but tell me your name. She must be telling she's got a copy of my book, I think. Yes, you. Nicole. Nicole. All right. I don't think she is, but maybe I'm asserting Nicole is African American. Okay? And I'm also asserting that she is in southern Pennsylvania, uh, let's say Altoona. I've been to Altoona. Uh, and we are in 1857. Okay? I'm batting over three instead of in terms of the truth, but here we are. And Nicole is in. Now, I am a planter, a plantation owner from near Baltimore. I come upon Nicole in the next town west of, of Altoona. There is a little town just west of Altoona, and she's buying something there, okay? And I assert, Nicole, there you are, she's my slave. Now, all you folks that were actually listening to a lecture in some college room in this little town west, all of you people in this room are under this act required to help me catch her. She, if she has a brain in her head, is gonna make a bolt for the door, and you'll see why in a minute, because under this act, her goose is already cooked. If she does make a bolt for the, you guys are required to help me. If any of you are gendarmes, and some of you may be, you may be city policemen, or even parking enforcers, or justices of the peace, or deputy sheriffs, whatever. If any of you are that, then you're required under this act to help me go track her down, okay? So we catch her. We take her to federal court, a special court set up just for this purpose. And indeed, we have a rather judicial looking gentleman just behind you and to your right with a fine looking beard. Um, He's, he's not moving because he's a, he's a judge and he's very sedate. He's ready. Um, so Nicole says, wait a minute, I'm not only not his slave, I'm not anybody's slave. I'm a free black person. I've lived in southern Pennsylvania my whole life. Only Nicole can't say anything in federal court against the white person. Black folks can't testify against white people. 
Now, if, I, if Nicole had a good white friend who could testify on her behalf, but I delivered the daughter when she was in the next town over, her goose is cooked. I say, she's my slave. Two weeks ago, she ran off from me in, in Maryland. Furthermore, he gets paid, in today's terms, the equivalent of about $350 by the federal government if he finds for me. He gets paid the equivalent of $175 if he finds for her. So there's a bribe built right into the act for him to find for the slave owner. Well, Pennsylvania doesn't really like this very much. Pennsylvania's trying to run a free state. And not only are all escaped slaves who make their way across the Mason Dixon line into Pennsylvania uh, in terrible trouble because of this act, so are Pennsylvania citizens like Nicole, right, who can, uh, it's what I call the reverse underground railroad from freedom into slavery. Right? I talk about it in my book, Rise Across America. So Pennsylvania says, well, we don't like this act. We know we can't secede. We know we can't nullify. But you know, we do have some power as a state. We have some rights. For instance, and this is what they passed, for instance, you deputy sheriffs, you gendarmes, you state police, you do what you have to under this act. But we're not paying you for that time, because we are in charge of when we pay our officers. South Carolina is outraged at this, and they say so. They're outraged at New York State, because New York no longer allows what's called slavery transit. Now that's kind of what we might call it temporary slavery works like this. The, the good, rich white folks of um, uh, Charleston, let's say, um, don't want to spend August in Charleston. And in fact, having spent part of August in Charleston a year ago, I understand that. It's kind of hot and humid. Maybe they'd like to see some Broadway plays. You know? So they go to Manhattan, and they bring their cook along. And New York says, because they don't want to cook their own food, they say, no, no, no. If you bring your enslaved cooking to New York, she becomes free. We're running a free state. South Carolina is outraged at this, and they say so. They're outraged at Massachusetts, because Massachusetts lets blacks vote. Now, who votes in America is a state's right. Up until the 15th Amendment gets passed, two whole eras after this during Reconstruction. But nevertheless, South Carolina says, no, it's our business. Now, black folks have no rights. A white person is supposed to respect them. You shouldn't be letting them vote. So South Carolina goes on and on about states' rights, all in the negative. They are entirely against states' rights. So that 35% of you, that's exactly right, who said states' rights, you're right. If by that you meant South Carolina was seceding against the, but you didn't mean that, right? Okay, and the majorities across America, I congratulate you, incidentally, because more of you said slavery than any other single answer. Okay. Slavery is certainly the right answer. Now let me say one other thing. That 7% of you who said the election of Lincoln, that's okay too. That's a different kind of answer. It's a trigger. Yeah, some of these people are doing a high five and they didn't quite do it. Um, it's a trigger rather than an underlying cause. Um, but South Carolina is absolutely upset about the election of Lincoln, and they say so in the document. Now, why are they upset with Lincoln? They say so too, of course. And that's because he's against slavery. So it all comes back to the S word in the end. Tariffs and taxes, they say nothing about tariffs and taxes. Why would they? The, the Tariff Act is, that they're operating under was written by a Virginian in 1854. Uh, ain't nobody complaining about it in the South. It's very low. Not an issue. Okay. So across the US, most people get it wrong. Even in this room, most of you got it wrong. When we add together the groups getting it right, it's 42%, 58% got it wrong. Uh, incidentally, I asked this question uh, Last, was it? Last fall, I was the banquet speaker at the Association, the American Association for State and Local History. These are the people who run the history museums across the U.S. Uh, everything from the Massachusetts State Historical Society Museum to the little museums you know in every little town. And this is a bunch of hundreds of people uh, at this banquet. Eighty-five percent said states' rights. So they get it longer, if that's a word, <laughs> than K-12 teachers. And K-12 teachers get it longer than you guys. So, so, we're, so we're in trouble because it's 150 years afterward. Now, the question comes up then, how come? This, I submit, the secession of 11 states and the ensuing civil war is far and away the most important thing that happened in this country after its founding. Okay? And we get it wrong. We teach it wrong, both at historic science and K-12. 
We teach you diametrically wrong. I mean, we're literally saying they seceded for states' rights when they seceded against states' rights. How can we do this? To answer that question, we have to look at it. This doesn't disconcert you. It must be a regular thing. <laughs> Bristol Community College and Ordnance Center. Okay. I'm impressed. Um, at dinner, people can explain this. Okay. Um, how can we be getting it wrong? Or maybe that explosion was because I just reached a high point and they were appreciating what I said. Okay. That's good. I'll go with that. I want to show you when we started to get it wrong. Because when we started to get it wrong is a very important era in American history, and it's an era that few people know about and teach about. Okay? And it has two legacies for the present to us today, and one of them is distorted history. I want to show it to you by beginning with the opposite. Uh, this is a very famous picture. How many of you have seen this picture? Okay, good, for most of you. And now you all have. Next time somebody asks you, read it. This is, of course, a picture of an African American who had been whipped. It's usually titled, as it is here, After the Flogging. And the picture was taken in May or June of 1863 in Louisiana, near the Mississippi River. Now, the United States Army and Navy controlled most of the Mississippi River throughout most of the Civil War. In fact, after July 4th, 1863, when they captured Vicksburg, they controlled pretty much all of them. Black folks flocked to the U.S. forces to be free, uh, to get married legally rather than the sham marriages they had endured during slavery, to make a buck, to help the war effort, to dig the, the fortifications, to do the laundry, uh, and when allowed to, January 1st, 1863, by terms of the Emancipation Proclamation, to sign up for service in the U.S. Army. And this man, whose name is Gordon, is stripped to the waist for his physical. Now, the picture is very rare because cameras had just been invented, uh, but the scene is very common. I estimate that 90% of all enslaved African Americans, male and female, had been whipped, okay? Uh, this is what a whipping looks like. He had been whipped the previous Christmas day, five months earlier, okay? It doesn't kill you, but I think you can see it's a life-altering event. It's a serious event, and indeed, if you look it up in what's usually called the slave narratives, by which we mean the narratives taken down by the WPA during the uh, Great Depression. Uh, this is a stimulus pro program in today's terms. Um, the whippings figure highly in there. And, and let me just give you a quote. Uh, we don't know what the question was, because they don't include the questions, but the question we can infer, it must have been, were you ever whipped? And, and here's the answer of a man uh, in Texas. In 1937. Oh, yes, sir, I was. Uh, and it took me two days to get over it, too. Two days lying in the bunk to get over it. And I mean to get over it in the body. I haven't gotten over it in the heart. No, sir, I haven't gotten over it in the heart to this day. I think you can see it might take you a while to get over it. And that happened to him. You can do the math. 1937, freedom came to Texas in 1865. Quite a ways before. Well, this scene caused even a democratic platoon to become abolitionist in a moment because they realized that somebody had lied to them about slavery. Slavery wasn't just this nice to the community down in the rural, um, and, and yes, we are telling our black folks what to do, but they probably need to be told. No, slavery depended on force, on violence, on this. And then, too, the United States Army came to depend, especially in the West, on Gordon, and on Mrs. Gordon and all the little Gordons, particularly in Grant's campaign on Vicksburg, uh, and later on in Sherman's campaign into Georgia, to Atlanta, and then to the sea, and then up through uh, the Carolinas. Because in both of those campaigns, Grant and then Sherman, pretty much Grant entirely, abandoned supply lines. Uh, I won't give you a big military history about this, except to say that uh, Grant tried various ways to capture Vicksburg. This is Vicksburg. We're looking at a map of Mississippi, and if you think this is easy to do it in reverse, it's quite difficult. Here's Mississippi over here, I think, yes. Um, and here's the Mississippi River, and here's Vicksburg right in the middle. Vicksburg called the Gibraltar of the Confederacy. It looks down on the Mississippi River, and it can shell anything that comes by, and so it completely stopped all trade from the heartland of America to the world, because that went out in the Mississippi River to uh, New Orleans. So Grant tried various ways to capture it. Finally, he marched his men past it 
on the Louisiana side, the Louisiana, Louisiana side, excuse me, um, and floated his uh, boats past it late at night, only lost one because he kind of caught him by surprise. Then he's south of Vicksburg, in fact, he's about 30 miles south, and he then engages in a campaign in which he abandoned supply lines. This had never been done before, but hardly ever. Um, he sent his cavalry on a raid through North Mississippi. Why? The cavalry is the eyes and ears of the army. That's how we know where the other side is. We send our cavalry, they come back. I mean, we don't have GPS and satellites and stuff, right? He sent them off in order to drive off the Confederate cavalry. And the two cavalry did shadow each other. It's called Ryerson's Great Horse North. Why did he do that? Because he knew the Confederates would never know where he was, whereas he knew he would always know where they were, because he relied on the black infrastructure. This part of Mississippi, which is southwest Mississippi, below Vicksburg, was then and is today 75% black. And everywhere his army went, they it was the best day of their lives, right? It's the day they became free, at least temporarily. They huzzahed the army, they gave it food, they gave it water, they told them the best route to Jackson, because he first went off to Jackson uh, and took it after two little battles on the way. Uh, told them where the Confederates were. When they reach Jackson, they're being shelled by the Confederate artillery. And an old African American comes out from West Jackson and says, um, don't worry, the main branch of the army has already retreated north to Canton, some 15 miles north. They just left their artillery here to shell you. And if you follow me, we'll sneak in behind them and we'll capture them. They followed him, they stuck in, they took the artillery. The Battle of Jackson was over before it ever began. Really. And then they proceed to go to the west, fight two more battles, and, and snare the other half of the Confederate army in Vicksburg and surround it. And on July 4th, 1863, as I mentioned, uh, Vicksburg surrenders. Well, so black folks made that all possible, and the, the United States Army rather rapidly becomes abolitionist. Now, particularly from Massachusetts, there were some abolitionists in the Army when they started, but most folks were not. None of the Democrats were, and most of the Republicans weren't abolitionists, but they became abolitionists, and this is also why. Uh, this is another pretty famous picture. Uh, it's titled, The True Defenders of the Constitution. And it appeared in Harper's Magazine. Now, Harper's still publishes today, but back in the 19th century, Harper's was the most important uh, magazine in America because it had a much bigger circulation proportionally then, and also because it was the unofficial organ of the Republican Party. What do you see here? Mainly, you see two dead people right, in the foreground, one white, one black, equal in death. And you realize, if you think about it, they were pretty much equal in life as well, uh, doing the same job for what, after a, a pay dispute got ironed out, it was the same pay. And this kind of thing influenced the thinking of uh, white northerners. And in fact, if you listen past the N-word, because the N-word is not the, men the, the issue here, uh, listen to this letter sent home by a private from Maine. Quote, I have a much higher opinion now of the nigger than I did just 60 days ago. And he goes on to describe the performance of this USCT group, or probably a regiment, United States colored troops, just to the right of his, uh, and how well they fought and so on. And you folks here, uh, if you go to your state capital, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you have the best representation of this in the United States, and I hope you've all seen it. And I'm talking, of course, about the famous monument often called Colonel Shaw and his colored regiment, or the 54th Massachusetts, which is right opposite your state capital. Uh, it's really something. So if you haven't already seen it, be sure you do next time you go to Boston. You can take off the entire cost of your trip to Boston from your income tax, because I told you to say this. Um, <laughs> Give me a call when you're audited. And, uh, and be sure to read the inscription uh, on all sides of it. It's quite a monument. Well, so the United States Army rather rapidly becomes abolitionist. Uh, if you have any questions about that, ask me. And I, I can prove it to you if I haven't already. This anti-slavery impulse becomes a, a pro-black influence, uh, uh, impulse. It becomes uh, in favor of, well, it, here's, it, here's where it winds up during Reconstruction. Uh, it influences our Reconstruction policies, and it influences the cartoons of, of this, the most famous cartoonist in the history of the country. This is, of course, Thomas Nast. Uh, Nast more or less invented our notion of uh, Uncle Sam, uh, of Columbia, you know her through Columbia pictures, you know, standing for the United States, 
District of Columbia. Here, this is a cartoon by him in 1865, shows Columbia with her hand on the shoulders. Can you see the man? Okay, that's good, because if you couldn't, I'd tell you to come down. That's uh, she's got her hand on the shoulders of African American. I think you can see he's reasonably uh, handsome, looking all right. Uh, I hope you can see he's in uniform. I, I'm sure you can see he's on crutches. He's lost much of a leg. And she's saying, and not this man, and the readers of Harper's, in which this appears, uh, knew that what the full meaning is, here we've given back the right to vote and full citizenship to every last confederate except the top leadership, and not this man who gave up his leg and perhaps much of, almost his life for our cause. This is an outrage. So this is an argument for the 15th Amendment, the Voting Rights Amendment. And it worked. We passed it. Not only that, we passed the 14th Amendment, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, some of you are old enough, and all of you have parents who are old enough, to remember when we couldn't pass the Equal Rights Amendment on behalf of women, when women were 51% of the voters in the country, but in 1868, we passed it on behalf of blacks, when blacks were 0% of the voters of the country. It's a great achievement. It gives us all equal rights under the law, due process. How did the Democrats reply to this anti-racism? Well, with straight racism. Uh, this is an example from 1868. I hope you can read the banner, the Eagles holding a banner saying anti-Negro suffrage. So this is an argument against the 15th Amendment. I know you can read where it says all who are opposed to Negro equality. So this is an argument against the 14th Amendment. Come to our Democratic meeting. This one happens to be in Missouri in 1868. And in fact, the Democrats maintained perfect party discipline. For the rest of the century, every single Democrat, even if elected from Massachusetts, voted against every single civil rights measure ever proposed, okay? Well, this perpetual racism from the Democrats got to the Republicans from time to time, and here it is getting to Nash. This is his depiction of the only state legislature ever to go under black control, the uh, South Carolina legislature. And these black folks, this is eight years later, these black folks don't look reasonable. They look like disgusting caricatures. And they don't know how to behave. They're waving their fists and stuff. Right in the center, you can see a, a handsome-looking white gentleman, but he's just kind of bemused by all this bad behavior around him. And then up in the corner, there's, there's Columbia. And she's saying, enough of all this racial agitation. Let us just have peace. Well, the Republicans got back their anti-racism from time to time. But in 1890, they lost it forever. Three things happened in 1890 that make it the beginning of this period. Remember we're talking about a period? The period when we started lying about the Civil War and why the Southern states seceded. And the period is called, the, and dig this, write it down, the nadir of race relations. Some people pronounce that word nadir. This is an English language word. It's not a special word. It means low point. All right, so that was the zenith. It's not Ralph, N-A-D-I-R, okay. The nadir of race relations is the period from 1890 to about 1940. Okay? During this era, we went more racist as a nation, in our thinking, than at any other point. Now, I'm not here telling you it was better to be black in 1859 under slavery than to be black in 1919. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we went more racist during the nadir than any other time. What was the nadir marked by? Well, it was marked by this one thing, this being a lynching, okay? Now, some people, especially some of your students, may think a lynching has to be by hanging. No, the definition of a lynching is this. A lynching is a public murder done with considerable support of the community. This man is being burned to death. You can see that it's being done by, with considerable support of the community because these folks are happily being photographed committing a felony, right? They know that they're not going to be prosecuted. The sheriff may even be in the picture. He doesn't care. And that's, of course, what's so chilling about a lynching. Not all victims were black, but two-thirds of them were. Um, and lynchings go to their all-time high during the nadir. This goes to its all-time high during the nadir. This being Confederate monuments. The U.S. monuments mostly go up between 1864 and 1890. The one I just mentioned in Boston is a dramatic exception. And that's quite interesting. But almost all of the U.S. monuments go up 1864 to 1890. Confederate monuments mostly go up between 1890 and 1940. Why? Because you put up monuments 
after you win, right? If you don't believe me, come to D.C., where I live, and go see the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We lost that war, right? And that monument didn't go up. That monument goes down. It is a gashing earth, right? <coughs> so I'm asserting, and I'm, I know it's a joke in a way, but I'm asserting dead seriously that in 1890, the Confederates, or we really should call them the Neo-Confederates, which is why I'm titled my book, The, the Confederate and Neo-Confederate Leader, won the Civil War. And they won it in several ways. And one of them was on the ground with these states. And I'll give you an example. This one itself is a bad example, is a, is a good example of this bad practice, but I won't go into it. I'm going to instead mention the state of Kentucky. Now, you may remember that Kentucky never seceded. And you may also know that Abraham Lincoln once allegedly said, and I think probably did say, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. Now, Incidentally, that's why, as one of the reasons why he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation just as he did. It doesn't do anything about slavery in Kentucky. And in fact, he held Kentucky. Kentucky did not secede. Kentucky did send 35,000 troops to the Confederacy, but it sent 90,000 to the US, and it never seceded. Today, Kentucky has 74 Civil War monuments. Two of them are for the US, and 72 are for the Confederacy. So the Confederates, or I should say the Neo-Confederates, got Kentucky. They couldn't hold it in the 1860s. They got it between 1890 and 1940, and they got it with these. Does it make a difference? You betcha. If you have a Confederate landscape, it's almost incumbent upon you. It's certainly a lot easier for you to have a Confederate mindset, even a Confederate heart. And I'll show you one more picture of, of, the, of, this, of this process, if you will. This is a picture from the center of the Nader. This is July 4th, 1913, Gettysburg. 50 years later to the day for when Pickett's charge failed and the US won the Battle of Gettysburg. These are the Confederates on the right in gray, the US on the left. The same people, 50 years later, shaking hands. <coughs> Pretty dramatic. Well, the rapprochement is great. And in fact, the rapprochement had happened well before 1913. But I submit there's something wrong with the terms. I think the terms go something like this. I think the white North was saying at this point to the white South, white Confederate South, you people were wrong to have seceded. And I think the white Confederate South says, well, yeah, you have a point. But then they turn around and say to the North, you people were wrong to have foisted Negro equality on us during Reconstruction. And the white North says, well, you have a point. And so this rapprochement is based on the death of equal rights for all, uh, the end of citizenship for African Americans. So it is during this era, 1890 to 1940, that the neo-Confederates redefined why they seceded. They just flatly lie about it, and now they claim to have seceded for state rights. Down is up, up is down. Furthermore, they even renamed the Civil War, and they call it the war between the states. Some of you have heard that term. Not one person said that when it was going on. When it was going on, it was called the Civil War. Duh. Or the Great Rebellion. It was not called the war between the states. I want to show you just one or two more pictures about this terrible era that the neighbor. Oh, I'll show you this one next. This, this is what? Can we say that a little more together? This is the? KKK. Yes, the Ku Klux Klan. And this is Ku Klux Klan Roman numeral two, right? The first Klan was sudden. It started in 1866, ended around 1877, when they had thrown out interracial rule in all of the southern states. Well, that's not quite true. When they had thrown out the interracial governments in all the southern states, black folks still voted until the 1890s. Right. Plan two, 1915 to 1929, and this one is national. In fact, this picture is from Maine. It's from Portland, Maine. The Klan was big in Maine. Mount Pelier, Vermont, I used to teach at UVM, University of Vermont. Uh, Mount Pelier has now 9,000 people in it. In 1920, it had 5,000 people. In 1923, it had a Klan that rally that drew 23,000 people. There have been 23,000 people in Mount Pelier exactly once since the invention of the planet Earth, and that was for that Klan rally. Okay? The Klan briefly took over four states, Georgia, Oklahoma, Indiana, and Oregon. This is national. 
And let me just show you the amazing depth of this racism. You know, I wrote a book called Sundown Towns. In fact, I have a whole bunch of visuals about that that I'm not going to show them to you uh, this time. Uh, a sundown town, and Massachusetts had a bunch of them, but I haven't done much research on it in Massachusetts. A sundown town is a town that's all white on purpose, okay? Uh, it's called a sundown town because some of them, this is, a, this is my book called Sundown Towns, and it has a picture on the front, it has a, a sign on the front, that sign still exists, that says, whites only within city limits after dawn. It's from a town in Connecticut, okay? Uh, most of the signs were much nastier, although Politeness is not what, this is nasty enough. Uh, most of them said things like this, and I'm going to have to use the N word again. Uh, Nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Manitowoc. That was the sign at the edge of Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Same sign at the edge of Hawthorne, California, or Payne, Illinois, or hundreds of other. You didn't have to have a sign to be a sundown town. Uh, but the sundown towns go to their height during the nigger, right? And this is an attempted creation of a sundown town. Uh, little racial riots occurred all across the north, throwing blacks out of uh, cities and towns that they were in. And one of the most important of these riots was in Springfield, Illinois in 1908. Uh, it's the only one, the only one that really got much attention. And it got attention solely because it was, of course, Abraham Lincoln's hometown. And it showed how much we had sunk in race relations. And indeed, the, the mob shouted as they attacked two black neighborhoods. Abe Lincoln brought you in and we will drive you out. And this picture is the day after the riot was finally checked by the, the National Guard, which had to be called out. It was the state capital after all. And in this picture, you can see a tavern. This is a tavern. And there's a tree in front of it. And this is, the tree, this is one of the two trees from which the mob lynched hung uh, African Americans. I think this is the tree from which they hung an 80, this is such a sad story, they hung an 82-year-old black man who was a shoemaker, a shoe repairer, and had and knew Abraham Lincoln and repaired his shoes personally, uh, whose crime was that he had been married for 50 years to a white woman and was still married to her. So they hung him for that. And what are we looking at? What's odd about this tree? This tree don't got no branches, all right? You know why? Because white folks are picking off pieces of it as souvenirs to put on their mantle to celebrate this wonderful deed, right? And the next day after this, here's the tree. We're now even moving. Tell me about it later. Um, do you see the tree? The tree is marked by an X. It is now this time. More souvenirs have been collected. Do you see why I call it the name? It's not my tree. Do you see why it is called the nature of race relations? Um, this is scary stuff. And finally, two more pictures about this, about this era. This happened during the Nader. This was put up. This is a picture of Christopher Columbus on the, on the state capitol grounds in Indianapolis. Now, as far as we know, Columbus never got to Indiana, but <laughs> that didn't stop the good Italian Americans in 1922 of Indiana from putting this up, and I'm gonna read it to you. Christopher Columbus, born in Genoa, Italy, 1451. Now, as those of you who know who have read chapter two of Lies and Teacher told me, we don't know that for sure, it might be so. It's also possible that he was Jewish and Spanish and had escaped Italy, we're not sure, but okay. Born in Genoa, discovered America, 14, uh, October 12, 1492. This is, of course, true, right? It's exactly true in the same sense that about 25 years ago, I discovered oregano. <laughs> to me. <clears throat> and it's good. And, and so is America. Well, anyway. This land of opportunity and freedom was thus preserved for humanity. Presumably it would have sunk under the waves. By the perennial genius abiding in the Italian race. Interesting last word, isn't it? Okay. And the reason I'm showing this is because during the Nader, Italians became white. Now, you may think I'm making a joke, but you, you know I'm not, really. In fact, I suggest another field trip for you. Come to D.C., lots of things to see about history in D.C., and one of them is just walk around the original building of the Library of Congress. You don't even have to go inside. And as you walk around, you will see 
the 37, they're called the 37 ethnographic heads. These are carved in stone. They are all of young adult males, age 20 to 40, maybe. Incidentally, you feminists, you don't want to be in on this one, so don't, don't protest. Um, they show the third, they're carved in stone above the windows. They show the 37 races of mankind in, 19, in 1898 when that building went up. Okay? Now, you might say, Lowen, that's ridiculous. We know there are three races. There's whites, there's blacks, and there's, um, um, uh, uh, this is not politically correct. Um, there's yellow, uh, the Asians, Asians, that's it, okay. Except what about American Indians? They're not exactly Asians. And then we got Australian Aborigines. They're not exactly black Africans. And, and now, what do we do with the Malaysians? I'm getting confused. And of course, the right answer, the only real answer is, there's one race, right? It's called human race, and everything else is a sociological construction. And so what I'm telling you is, during the Nader, white folks became white, okay? Uh, Jews became white toward the end of the Nader. Irish became white actually before the Nader. There's a really good book on this called How the Irish Became White. I recommend it to you. A fairly good book called How the Jews Became White. Uh, we need a book, maybe, How the Italians Became White, How Serbians Became White, and so on. And finally, we have my favorite picture of this terrible era. If you can imagine having a favorite picture of it, what do you see? And this works terrific, incidentally, when you're teaching middle school. I've shown this to fifth graders. I've shown all these pictures to fifth graders. Um, you see a white kid, maybe he's five years old. Can you see that he's whipping somebody? Now, you guys just saw a while back a picture of a whipping. Isn't this fun? Of course, he's not hurting him. The man has stopped to, to uh, light his pipe with a cigarette. The caption, some of you maybe can't read it, the caption is, get out, uncle, and you need to understand that the man is not the boy's uncle, this African-American. Uh, you use the term uncle during the nigger because we white folks wouldn't want to call a black person sir or mister. That would imply he's fully human, so we say uncle, or maybe if she's female, aunt or auntie. We still have these terms, of course, with Aunt Jemima pancake flour and pancake syrup and, and Uncle Ben's rice. And the reason this is my favorite picture of the Nader is because the cream of wheat people, in their infinite wisdom in 1914, believed that this would make most Americans, right in the middle of the Nader, most Americans feel warm and friendly inside, and so they would want to rush out and buy their product. Okay? And they probably knew their market. Isn't that something? Well, I've got a, a kind of a final picture I want to show you. It ties in sundown towns, and it also uh, is my final picture I'm going to show you, and so it's kind of a culmination of the Nader. This is a Tarzan cartoon from 1937, toward the end of the Nader. Um, if you ask me, incidentally, there's three specific reasons why we have to date the Nader at exactly 1890 for its beginning. But when it ends is kind of a matter of taste. Most people end it a little earlier, but I have reasons to end it in 19, about 1940. Okay? And this is one reason. 1937, uh, what's this got to do with the Nader? Well, does it show white supremacy? Kind of does, right? You can literally see Tarzan is walking on the heads of a bunch of black folks. And if you had seen the previous three panels, you realize it shows it intellectually as well, because these black folks, residents of Africa, for Christ's sakes, have no idea what to do about these jungle beasts that confront them. But Tarzan has both the brains and the courage if he can just get past the close pressed forward, so he walks on them. Okay. What does it have to do with sundown towns? Well, Edgar Rice Burroughs wrote the first three Tarzan novels while he was in a sundown suburb of Chicago. And he made so much money off of them that he then moved to Los Angeles and invested the proceeds in his own sundown suburb of Los Angeles, which he named Tarzan. Okay. Now, I submit to you that we have two legacies of the Nader to this day. If anybody's at the lights, you can bring them up now, because I'm almost done, and I'm not going to show any more pictures. And if they're not at the lights, that's OK, too. Those two legacies are, first of all, distorted history, which we saw right in this room. You know, a majority, 58%, getting secession wrong. You guys did better than average, but you still got an F. <laughs> um, and most groups get an F minus minus, okay? Uh, the last time I asked this question, it was in a high school uh, just last week. Where was I? I can never remember. Oh my gosh, let's see, I'll have to 
Well, I don't, I literally don't remember where I was. I traveled a lot. Um, and not one person said slavery. Okay. Um, the story of history, not just about the Civil War, but about all kinds of other things, about the presidency of U.S. Grant, about the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, about Christopher Columbus. You might say, Columbus? What's they got to do with the neighbor? Our view of Columbus was formulated in 1892, the 400th anniversary, and it's still in the textbooks today to a great extent. And that was right in the middle of the neighbor, right? The story of history and the other legacy of sundown towns and sundown neighborhoods. This is when Boston went so segregated. Boston wasn't segregated in 1890. By 1940, it was highly segregated. Probably, I've never studied uh, Fall River, but probably Fall River as well, maybe Bristol even. Uh, this is when suburb after suburb of Boston excluded blacks, and some of them excluded Jews. Uh, the same is true for suburb after suburb of New York City, of Los Angeles, and, and every place in between. Uh, I'll say one, one more sentence about sundown towns. It'll probably wind up being a couple of sentences. When I went to write this book, uh, I knew I was going to do more research in Illinois than in any other single state. I thought I would discover maybe 10 sundown towns in Illinois, because I'm from Illinois, maybe 50 across the country. Not so. I am now at a total of 506 sundown towns in Illinois alone, which is 70% of all the towns that there are in Illinois. I think a similar percentage afflicted Pennsylvania, Oregon, and various other northern states. Okay? And so we're still fighting our way out from that. Uh, as a final blow, uh, two years ago I was in a county in Illinois which voted for Obama, 5346, just as did the US. Okay? African Americans cannot live in this county right now. It is a sundown county, and it's by no means the only one. So this is a tremendously important period, the nature of racial relations. Do we teach it? Do we even know about it? Is there something wrong with our history education? That's my talk. Thanks for your attention. Please give me some questions. <laughs> the question period is the best part. So uh, you don't have to be really old to ask a question either. There's one. I can't see anything but a shadow, but. I would assume as you move south, you would get states' rights as a reason for secession. It would, be, it would be greater. Is that true in your experience? No, no southern state claims that they're seceding for states' rights. It's, it's south Carolina is about as far south as you can get. But Mississippi is the uh, next state or the third state, I forget which. I think the second state to secede. And it states, as it, in its opening reason why, our position, is, I'm quoting, our position is thoroughly identified with the cause of slavery. It's such, a, it's such a sentence, I don't want to get it wrong. Let's see if I can find it really fast. I'm in Louisiana, I'm getting close, Texas. Texas, incidentally, reprints what South Carolina says, uh, somewhat, almost verbatim, uh, and uses the same title. And Mississippi uses exactly the same title. Declaration of the immediate causes which induce and justify the secession of the state of Mississippi from the Federal Union. Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of the commerce of the earth, dot, dot, dot. Uh, a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. Okay? And so they too say nothing positive about states' rights. They go on to label those states they're upset. Uh, Texas does too. I meant your not the original um, rationale for secession, but your experience is for the South, would you expect? Oh, you mean, oh, ah, you're asking about how the vote comes out. Yes. Thank you. I, sometimes you say something that goes in this year and comes right out that way without really meeting any resistance. Now I get it. Um, the first time I ever did that quiz, I did it at the Greensboro Historical Society in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. And the vote came out uh, about, it wasn't as bad as some places. It came out about a little over 50% for states' rights, uh, about 25% for slavery, and about 12.5% for tariffs and taxes and for Abraham Lincoln. And then we had this conversation. That, I, that was, I'd never done it before, so I didn't know how, how it would come out. Well, it, that was pretty bad, I thought. Uh, but I said, well, of course, North Carolina is a slavery state, and it seceded. 
A week later, I was speaking in St. Cloud State University, which is not only in Minnesota, but it's northwest of the Twin Cities. You can't be in a university and be in the U.S. and be very much further north than that. So just for the heck of it, I did it again. I did the poll again. It came out slightly worse than North Carolina. Okay? I have now done this poll in North Dakota, in Southern California, in Cleveland, uh, to a largely black group in Memphis. Uh, this was the teaching staff of the Memphis Public Schools. It comes, it almost always comes out within five percentage points, wherever I am, it does, to my astonishment. Uh, and the percentage usually voting, you guys are not within five percentage points. The percentage voting for states' rights is usually 60 to 75 percent. Okay. Did that answer the question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Yeah. Isn't that interesting, though? Yeah. So we get it wrong all over the country. Yes, ma'am. When I saw your four options, I was a little hesitant at first because I was taught that it was the state's right to have slavery. So, but you had these two separate things. So, yeah. Now the thing is, states' rights to have slavery. Um, the issue. I understand what you're saying. The, the issue there is that what we really mean by states' rights is we want what the states' rights against the federal government. Right. The federal government is doing stuff that we that we don't like, and we want to have our rights to do what we want to do, okay? And that's completely wrong. And the reason it's completely wrong is because, of course, when they seceded, they controlled the federal government. They seceded during the Buchanan administration. The Buchanan administration was not only democratic, it was under the thumb of the fallout pro-slavery wing of the Democratic Party. And James Buchanan, although from Pennsylvania, was a member of the far out pro-slavery wing of the Democratic Party. By the way, one reason he was, was because he was gay. Did you know that he was gay? And his long-term lover was a plantation owner from Alabama and senator from Alabama, William Rufus King, briefly vice president under Pierce uh, from, uh, from New Hampshire. Pierce was also a member of the far out pro-slavery wing of the Democratic Party. So for at least eight years, and in fact for most of the years, um, since the founding of the country, um, slave owners or far out partisans of slave owners controlled the federal government. Uh, about the only exceptions, really, are the three administrations controlled by people whose last name starts with Adams, right? The, the Adams administration and the, and the second Adams administration. Was the first Adams in for four years or eight years? Four, four years. So it's not 12 years, eight years, okay? Um, otherwise, pretty much entirely, uh, the federal government was controlled by slave owners. Uh, at the time they seceded, the, the South had a majority of either 72 or 63, depending on how you count it exactly, on the Supreme Court, uh, and so on. So they weren't upset with the, the, federal the, the federal government at all. They were on the side of the federal government and had just gotten the most amazing decision, the 1857 Dred Scott decision, uh, totally pro-slavery, uh, you may remember that the, I, but the South, went, especially South Carolina, went more and more and more radically pro-slavery. Uh, it, it you had to be more pro-slavery than thou, if you will. Uh, if you ran in South Carolina and you said, um, well, I, I'm perfectly content with the, with the uh, Missouri Compromise. You know, the Missouri, remember the Missouri Compromise? It says that the top line of Arkansas, also known as the bottom line of Missouri, uh, goes out to the west, goes out to the west remember which way I'm looking, um, and everything below it is going to be slavery and everything above it is going to be free. Well, in fact, Southerners knew that they're not likely to have a vibrant slavery economy in, say, Oregon or Montana, you know? But the, after a while, that got to be upsetting to them because it said, well, here's the federal government running some territory. I mean, it's the federal government that runs the territories, right? States run themselves, but the federal government runs the territories. And here they are telling us that uh, we can't bring our property, no matter what kind of property it is, uh, like in your, uh, I won't even pick on you in your case, her, uh, we can't bring her to Montana. This is an outrage. So uh, in 1854, uh, they get uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed, which says it's local option. And of course, both Kansas and Nebraska are above this line. Uh, so we're going to make them slave states if we can. It's a local option. And then in 1850, by 1857, they get a different re reaction from the Taney Court. They actually get the Taney Court to say that even if Montana or Nebraska or Kansas or whatever 
as, as a territory wants to be a free territory, it cannot be. The federal government has to guarantee slavery everywhere. Now, that's quite a decision, okay? They love the federal government. It's just not against, it's not about states' rights. Okay, it doesn't Thank you. I have a question in two parts. Um, in the United States, the textbooks that are used in the North and in the South, how much, and is there a big difference? And also, the second part, is there a difference between the textbooks that are used in private versus public schools? Did you hear a question? How? Yeah. They did. Uh, they should did. If you didn't hear it, ask this woman. <laughs> um, there used to be Northern textbooks and Southern textbooks. That stopped around 1960. However, what happened was, all the textbooks became Southern, in a way. Uh, what they say about the, the causes of the Civil War, about the causes, about secession, is mystified. It's, it's screwy. You can't get a clear decision from it. So the fact that most teachers think that it's states' rights means most students learn that it's states' rights, because they don't learn any better from the textbooks. And this is particularly upsetting to me um, it's, it's just an outrage. Let me, let me tell you how outraged I am. Uh, the, the second edition, and there will never be another one, the second edition of Lies My Teacher Told Me, you know, the first edition was based on my intensive reading of 12 high school American textbooks. Indeed, I'm the only American ever to have read 12 high school American textbooks. <laughs> it was a new death experience. You don't want to know. <laughs> For this second edition, I read six more of the last ones. Uh, I couldn't read 12 because of pub publisher consolidation. Plus, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Uh, so, one of the new six ones, actually the only one aimed at middle school, it's a huge, heavy, it's the heaviest textbook ever produced for middle school. Okay? This is actually an issue of the American Chiropractic Association I've come to learn, <laughs> which I think is kind of cool. You know, it's, we're breaking the students' backs, literally. Okay, uh, the textbooks on average, the first batch I read, the 12 that I read for the first edition averaged 888 pages, which is absurd. Now they average 1,152 pages, which is absurd dirt. Right? Um, there's no excuse for it. And indeed, you folks in Massachusetts, now that you don't have to go by the MCAS, let me suggest there's enough intellectual power just in this room. Plus, oh, I know where I was just last week. I was in Western Massachusetts, northern from here. I was in Hudson, Massachusetts just west of Boston. That's where all of the students voted against slavery, okay? And most of them voted for states' rights. Um, and I said this to Hudson, too, so you can get together with the folks in Hudson. What you need to do is get Massachusetts not to reinstate its multiple choice test for history, the infamous NX. You need, the only thing worse, of course, than having a multiple choice test, which I call a tweak test, I'll tell you why in a second, uh, in history, is not having that tweak test in history because then they don't teach history at all. You don't want that either. But you can follow what's happening just 20 miles from here. Rhode Island has a non-multiple choice test way of doing stuff. You know, the No Child Left Behind Act does not require multiple choice tests. This is not Bush's fault, all right? He did some bad stuff, but he didn't do this, all right? And so you don't have to do it. And now that you don't do it, now that you don't have an MCAS, at least not in history and social studies, you guys, some of you, would take it upon yourselves, maybe Bristol Community College could be a pioneer in this, to advocate to the state legislature and to the Board of Education and so on, a different way of testing for competence in history. You would be one of the leaders along with Rhode Island. Another state that does a better job is Vermont, and I think it borders Massachusetts, as I remember. Right? So you've got examples right here, so don't do that. Well, anyway. Um, so there's only one textbook. Now, I was on a harangue about these textbooks. Then you could adopt, and this is what you should adopt, a 300-page paperback for your K-12 education. These exist, and they're so cheap, relatively to the huge paper hardware, <coughs> that instead of renting them, and buying them, and loaning them to students and getting them back, you could give them to students, and you would save money. And that means the student can write in the margin. And as a teacher teaches him or her what's wrong or something, or as they have a thought, they were writing in the margin, and that's not defacing the book, that's adding to its intellectual value. And then they own a book. Do you know how many Americans, adults, have never owned a nonfiction book? You know, I'm serious. All kinds of them. 
although possibly a majority, certainly over over 25 percent, I think. A bunch of them. Okay. Um, that would be cool. Well, anyway, one of the new six books, the one aimed at middle school, this huge book that's just way too big and fat. You've got lots of reasons not to have a big fat textbook in the internet age. Uh, is by three famous historians, except it's not. It's allegedly by um, Alan Brinkley. He's a very famous historian about the Depression and stuff. Uh, Joyce Appleby, who wrote a very interesting book called uh, something about Can We Have Truth in History? It's a good book, but not a textbook. And James McPherson. James McPherson is our best Civil War historian, I think, at least he wrote the, wrote the best. I think it's the best book about civil, single volume history of the Civil War. And it completely obfuscates why the Southern states seceded. Now, he knows better. So I am sure that he did not write that textbook, not even the Civil War chapter. And I am willing to bet that he did not even read it. And in fact, in the new edition of Lies My Teacher Told Me, there's a new chapter. So those of you who have the old edition, you don't have to buy them and just get the new chapter, which you can look at in the library or something. Uh, the rest of you should buy it. Um, this new chapter is about uh, the Bush administration and our war in Iraq and our war in Afghanistan and what do the textbooks say about that and what should they. So here I am reading these six new books about this era. And I'm reading this book by two very famous historians. Uh, Borston and Kelly. Uh, Daniel Borston was for years the librarian of Congress. He won the Pulitzer Prize twice. Brooks Mather Kelly was the chief architect, chief archivist of Yale University. I'm saying, wait a minute, didn't I just read this? And I look over here at this other book, allegedly by, it's called Pathways to the Present, it's allegedly by four famous historians in Ohio, the new part of the, the recent history by Alan uh, Winkler whose title is Distinguished Professor of History at Miami University of Ohio. And yes, for paragraph after paragraph, page after page, these two books are identical. Except maybe this one has the word very in it. They have the same photographs, with the same captions. This is the largest plagiarism scandal in the history of the world, if you think about it. I mean, these people like Doris Kearns Goodwin and Stephen Ambrose, they didn't have enough footnotes, so they didn't use quotation marks like it. Here we have identity for paragraph after paragraph. And nobody cares. I'm the first person ever to discover it because nobody's ever read these books before. They just adopt them. Right? Uh, I got a front page story about it in the New York Times as a result. I called up, well, I didn't call up uh, Borston because he had just died, uh, but I called up his co author and I talked with him and he said, Borston did it. And he didn't mean Borston copied it, he meant Borston wrote that joke. And I said, well, did you know that for page after page, it's identical to this other book? And he said, and I quote, oh, no, that's terrible. So pretty soon he admitted, quote, Prentice Hall hired somebody to write it. I forget the man's name. So here the authors of the book do not even know the name of the person who wrote their book. That's the level of quality control we have here. Okay? Could be. And I actually met a woman after one of my talks come up, came up to me and said, yeah, you're exactly right about who writes these books. I wrote the chapter on the Civil War for the following book by Random House. And I said, well, what's your uh, qualifications for doing that? She said, I have a BA in English. <laughs> All right, so then I called up Winkler. And Winkler applied he had written his book. And I said to him, did you know that for page after page, it's identical to this other book? And he said, and I quote, oh, no, that's terrible. <laughs> and, he did. and I said, uh, and he said, I don't even own that book implying still that he wrote. Pretty soon he admitted he didn't write it. So I said to him, well, aside from the fact that you didn't write it, what do you think about it as a work of history? And he said, uh, just a minute, let me get it down from the shelf. Meaning, I don't know, I haven't read a word. Now, those of you who are real scumbags and get your, tech, your paper from Bristol Community College for $9.95 off the web, a, don't do it, and B, I hope you at least have enough brains to read the thing before you hand it in to your professor. These guys could have Osama bin Laden being a Jewish rabbi. They had no idea what they wrote, right? Does that explain why the textbooks have? And yes, they are used by private schools. There are some private schools, a few, that use actual college-level books. And the college-level books are considerably better. Okay? Uh, but then we have this kind of mysterious group of books that are allegedly for college, but really mainly used for high school. I'm talking about, for instance, the American pageant. Um, this college may use that. I mean, a lot of colleges do. Um, it's a high school book. I mean, it's not that. 
Oh, there's so many questions up there. Respond. I think you said two different things, and I'm going to respond to each of them. Um, first, I want, to, I want to agree with the first one, and I do want to disagree with the second. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. He's right. Um, it's not just history. I do think history textbooks are worse than in any other subject, uh, and I know they are, and, and other people agree with me about that. Um, but it does happen in all kinds of areas, and you mentioned a key one, evolution, and therefore biology textbooks and so on. Um, a friend of mine wrote a really good book about, it's a smaller book about uh, kind of an ethnic history of Vermont, and she's from and in Vermont. And the number one thing that happened to that book when it went to the publishers was drastic editing of the first five pages, because the first five pages talked about kind of how people first got to Vermont, and it didn't imply that it happened after Adam and Eve and, and in the last 4,000 years, you know, it implied that it happened a long time earlier, and so that got kind of mystified. And, and she put up with it, she didn't have a lot of social power to to deal with that. I mean, you know, once I've had a bestseller, now publishers listen to me, but they didn't before, you know, so I understood that. So you're right, uh, a lot of books get distorted, uh, including biology books and, and books you wouldn't even think have anything to do with uh, evolution necessarily, but they do get distorted so as to kind of mystify the whole treatment of evolution. Uh, I think you said then uh, that we as educators owe it to our students to teach evolution and its alternatives. No, I didn't say that. Oh. That's a religious alternative, as is the second one. So if we were to teach the first two as the alternatives, then what we have done is we've chosen the alternative that historians and archaeologists and so on pretty much agree on, with some disagreement within it, and one religious alternative, and we're teaching those two, which is favoring one religion among others. And, and we can then get into what do Muslims say, and what do Hindus say, and what do 
you know, and we would be entitled to infinite regress. Okay, but, but there is another alternative, and that we, we discussed in astronomy, and that is that we are all uniquely made of the original cosmic dust. And we have a professor on campus who has written a book, Cosmic Conversation, about that. And it's an excellent presentation, and it fits in very well. Well, stop. I'd like to hear about that, and I will make myself available to you afterward. I saw all these other hands on right over there. Very good question, Tim. Um, you said that the term the war between the states emerged during the nadir of race relations. I implied that, and that's not quite correct, but go ahead. I was going to ask you about the official records of the war between the state and the states and when they were printed. Was it at this point in time? The official records, I'm not called the official records of the war between the states. It's called the OR, she's exactly right. And the official records, the name of it is the official records of the Great Rebellion. Okay? okay. And, yeah. Isn't that interesting? When I did research at Old Dominion University, the copies that they had were the official records of the war between the states. Now, I never voted to publish them. Well, I should, I should I'll bet you. I'll tell you what, I'll do what I say with my kids. I'll bet you $500 million, which is totally fair, right? Because we all know we're not going to pay it off. Uh, uh, that they didn't say that. Go back and check. And if they did say it, they sure didn't say it in the inside. And if somebody is reminding them with that, it would be worthwhile finding out who and when. Uh, the OR, you can look them up online. Uh, they are the official records of the War of the Rebellion, uh, sometimes called the Great Rebellion, hence rebel. Right. Now, the term war between the states started being bandied about by ex-Confederates as soon as 1866, actually, and more often by 1868. But it really got established after 1890. That's what I should have said if I, but I didn't have time. But, okay. Yes, ma'am. She asked me something about, uh, can I comment on censorship in English classes, especially in literature classes you're yeah. talking about. Um, sure. Uh, one of the reasons I think that American history is much worse taught than any other subject is because in, in English classes, you are usually reading original sources. Uh, in American history, you're usually reading the textbook. And the textbook tries not to quote, quote original sources whenever possible. I mean, for instance, I just read to you two original sources, South Carolina and Mississippi, right? I think they're utterly clear. Our position is thoroughly identified with the with, with slavery. Well, I forget, I think I left out a word anyway. Now that's a punch statement, you know? The most important institution in the history of the world, or in commerce and civil whatever it said. Right. That's punchy. Any ninth grader, any fifth grader can understand that sentence better written than most textbook sentences, right? There is actually a textbook in American history, one of the 18 I read, that has two paragraphs on William Jennings Bryan's famous Cross of Gold speech. Now his, I'm going to have to have a lectern here, so I'm going to use this, I hope it will withstand it. His Cross of Gold speech is quite a speech, you know. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not press down on Raver's brow a crown of thorns, thou shalt not crucify mankind on a crown of thorns. Okay? Doesn't quote a word. The whole two paragraphs are in dull, boring textbook East, except for three words, Cross of Gold. There's no excuse for this. They can quote, but they don't. All right. At least literature classes quote, you know? A literature you, you, you have a, and even the title's better. You know, these titles of our books are things like The American Pageant, The Great Republic, Lies of the American Navy. I can't say these things without doing my arm somehow, you know? <laughs> uh, we don't have American literature saying The Great Literature of America. You know, it's called like Reader in American Literature, which is what it is, you know? That's cool. But anyway, and so they usually quote. Now, what you're getting at is, particularly in New York, I hope this isn't happening in Massachusetts, but maybe it is, uh, they remove some words, right? You don't want to have it, uh, maybe there's some sexy words, or uh, maybe there's damn, they remove some words. And, and I think that's an outrage. Yes, of course, there's a big issue about Huckleberry Finn, which uses the N word. Yeah. And the other thing I was referring to was um, the fact that they don't allow some books to be taught in schools, specifically Catch on the Rye, Fahrenheit 451, which is ironic in that the book Fahrenheit 451 is about banning books. So I was just 
Yeah. Not so much the literature anthologies, but um, uh, individual works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are, are you done? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I, I'm in favor of teaching lots of stuff. Now, I do think that when you pick books to teach, and we're not talking about the reader, as you say, we're talking about uh, novels, poems, etc. You, you have to think, why am I picking this? Who am I picking it for? There is such a thing as age appropriate. Uh, now, I, every picture I've shown you, uh, I have shown the fifth graders. They did fine. Um, and a lot of people think they can't handle this kind of thing. And I have a, a clue on how to handle it. I'll be talking about it in the workshop. Where is, where is the workshop? Can these folks come? Uh, I'm not sure how many spaces we have open. If people email me in the morning. Email him if you want to come to the workshop. And the workshop is at 9 o'clock, and it is at? It's on this campus? It is on the campus. On the campus. And how do you email you? Uh, herb.tracy at VersaCC. Herb, that's H-E-R-B, or herb, dot Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, at VersaCC. And we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Stop. Stop. No more from you. OK. Yes, sir. This may not be in the historical context that you're using, but do you know if uh, some of the reasons for the American Revolution had to do with slavery, uh, and I'm alluding, I guess, to, to some claims that Jefferson and Washington and some of the other founding fathers who were big slave owners had written to King George III uh, saying that the, who was he to tell them what to do with their property? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, the issue about slavery, slavery has distorted our foreign policy of course, that was foreign policy in a way, once we became independent. Slavery has distorted our foreign policy from the beginning until 1865 uh, in many ways. And it really messed up the foreign policy of Jefferson when he was president. But uh, the issue you're talking about, I think, has to do with the writing of the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence is a great work, but it's particularly a great work because we only read the beginning of it. Uh, after we read the beginning of it, which is the great part, then it becomes a laundry list of complaints against King George. And some of this laundry list is pretty scurrilous. I mean, it's not true, and it's a problem. I mean, one of the paragraphs, for instance, is he has encouraged the, I'm doing this from memory, he has encouraged the depredations of the merciless savages on our borders. In other words, he's behind these Indian raids. Well, it's quite the opposite. Uh, one of the biggest causes of the revolution was that many of our leaders, Washington was one of them in particular, uh, have, were laying claim to land, Indian land, that was beyond the proclamation line that the British had set up, that we couldn't go beyond because the British were trying to maintain peace with the American Indians. So it's just the opposite. Um, so there's some stuff in that. And one of the paragraphs that got removed, that Jefferson wrote, was that the British brought slavery to us, and it's an outrage. Now, when Jefferson wrote that, that's not at all what he said, kind of like that. When Jefferson wrote that, he, of course, had all these slaves. Washington had all these slaves. Washington, there was the Rights of Man movement. And of course, the beginning of the Declaration of Independence epitomizes that. And it's a wonderful movement. And as a result of the Rights of Man movement, and as a result of the American Revolution, many, many not no means, but over maybe 5% of American slave owners freed their slaves, including George Washington did. At, on the, the occasion of the death of his wife, I mean, he didn't do it right away, but nevertheless. Um, so that's kind of cool. Jefferson never brought himself to do it, except for slaves that he was, shall we say, related to. Um, but um, the reason that Petrograd got struck was because of objections from the slave-owning colonies soon to become slave-owning states. That's why it got removed. And, and so they were actually blaming King George and his predecessors for instigating slavery in the Americas, which is utterly facile. I mean, it, it, is it true that the colonists in the South didn't want these slaves? They got forced in on them? No, I don't think so. You know, they bought them happily. And, and of course, Massachusetts, I hope you know this, Massachusetts was the first colony to legalize slavery. And nobody made Massachusetts legalize it from Britain. Massachusetts chose to legalize it. Uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island and New York then proceeded to dominate the, the international slave trade on this side of the Atlantic, and they did so happily. <laughs> That's an example of what we call BS, bad sociology. Two more questions. You? One more question, her. Nobody else has your hand up. Really big. Um, 
I sign books I wrote. Uh, <laughs> if I sign American Pageant, I would have to sign it <laughs> with my book, and it might mess it up. Go ahead. You said, this, you said um, that Steve Wilson incorrectly. I do. Oh, well, I'm going to refer you to my book, honestly. The very first chapter, a wise my teacher told me, is called, I forget what it's called, but it's about heroification, how we make people into heroes. And it treats two people, Helen Keller and Woodrow Wilson. And it talks about what we don't say about those two guys. I'm using guys genetically, I don't know. Um, and um, what we don't say about Woodrow Wilson is an outrage. Um, we keep what we have of Woodrow Wilson is a view of him that came about during the Nader, right? 1890 to 1940. Between 1890 and 1940, we were as racist as anybody's ever been just about. Well, we weren't as racist as Hitler's Germany, but, but we tried. I mean, Hitler actually got some of his ideas from us, you know, from the American eugenics movement, which was during the Nader, and so on. And so our view of Woodrow Wilson is totally positive, and pretty much, uh, in the textbook. Well, Woodrow Wilson is in charge of two, two particular interesting processes. And one is, he segregated the American government. It didn't happen before him. The Navy in particular was integrated. He made it the most segregated branch of the armed forces. If you were sorting mail in Washington, D.C. or anywhere else, and you were black, you either had to give up that job or you had to sort it a separate thing. Uh, he segregated all the cafeterias in D.C. He, it, it's just funny with the tech of, of the whole Jim Crow thing. He was a key part of it. Uh, that, the, the KKK started doing his watch. He loved the movie, uh, uh, Earth of a Nation, which was the, the most racist, serious movie ever made in this country, and perhaps the, the best serious movie made up until its time. Um, he, his record on race relations is incomparably bad, but it doesn't make any difference because during the time that we wrote about him, which is how the text we still talk about him, uh, they pretty much leave that out because that's how everybody was. That's right. I mean, what do we think those people are anyway? They're not equal. We know that. So what, what was he doing wrong? And second, he invaded everybody he could get his hands on. You know, he invaded, uh, I think, 13 different countries. He invaded, uh, no, that's not quite true. But anyway, he invaded, he invaded Mexico several different times. He invaded all kinds of countries in Latin America. And he finally invaded the USSR uh, in two different, three different places. Uh, and we had troops in Russia trying to win on behalf of the whites against the Reds in their civil war um, until we took shellacking and finally had to evacuate on April Fool's Day of 1920. Textbooks just completely leave this out. Or if they include it in, I guess I am giving a whole thing about with rules. You should read the book anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's just say one thing, final thing about what, how they treat with Google. They say things like this. Um, troops were ordered into Russia in 1918. On April 1st, 1920, Woodrow Wilson ordered them out. Now, isn't that an interesting use of passive and active forces, okay? Who the heck ordered them in in 1918? <laughs> Who was president then? Oh, yes, that's right. That was um, Millard Fillmore. <laughs> Thanks for your good, a lot of good questions.